Hello. All right. So this is the makeup presentation for chapter 10. Uh, like I said in class, this is being recorded um, due to running short on time. Uh, so I'm still going to try and keep this presentation as brief as possible, uh, being as transparent as I can about what you need to know for the test, uh, what I want you to know from this chapter. And yeah, I hope you'll forgive me if I stutter a little bit. I sometimes tend to not do so well on camera, but let's go ahead and jump right in with the presentation. Let me just uh, turn this around. Yeah, as you can see, uh, chapter 10 is fairly short in terms of vocabulary. Uh, this is a chapter though, where in lieu of vocabulary, something that you're going to have to memorize instead, would be um, artists' names. Kind of like for how chapter nine, you need to know a few artists and what they did. Uh, chapter 10, you're also going to need to know a few artists' names as well as the names of their films. You don't have to worry about the date of the film or anything like that, but I do want you to know perhaps a little bit about them. Normally we would watch them in class, but again, in interest of time that's not a possibility so instead i'm going to link you to the videos um, that are mostly available on youtube these days yeah so again in case you're like all right what do i need to know for the test it's the name of the film the name of the filmmaker and what that film or filmmaker was famous for for example, you would need to know the name of the film, Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. Who made that film? John Hurwitz. And what is that film famous for? It won an Academy Award for every single category at the Oscars. Not true, by the way, but you get the idea. That's kind of what I want you to know for these chapters. All right, so for chapter 10, again, it's about film. And it's a good sort of segue out of chapter nine, because um, chapter nine is about photography. And that's what film is, photographs. Uh, it's just a whole lot of photographs shot very quickly and in sequence. Uh, and over time, early experiments in multiple uh, images, stroboscopic photography, like you see here by Edward Muybridge, gave way to the art of, knock knock, cinematography which is similar to photography, except as it applies to filmmaking. And as we discussed, photography is an art form where you need to know about framing and lighting and composition. And the same is true for cinema, and hence cinematography. And you might say that the father of cinematography is our first filmmaker here. All right, so the name is D.W. Griffith. Uh, the title of the movie, it's called Intolerance, subtitle The Modern Story. And as you can see, this film uh, dates all the way from 1916. And being over 100 years old, it is in the public domain. So you could potentially watch this entire movie since it is in the public domain. Um, and let me show you something here. You could potentially watch the whole movie. As you can see, it's available on YouTube. But as you also might notice, check this out. It's nearly three hours long and it is a silent film. I dare you to watch this. I think it would be awful. Frankly, I have never been able to get through the whole thing and I don't want you to attempt watching this weird, awkward, silent movie. Instead, I would ask you to watch this. Uh, this is a, as you can see, four minute edit. It's a compilation of what you might say the highlights of some of the best parts of Intolerance. Um, they splice together some of the best sequences. I think it's much more digestible. But to kind of come back to can the balloon juice what's on the test, uh, as I said, D.W. Griffith, Yep, is the mo is the uh, the master, the inventor of modern cinematography, um, and one of the biggest things that he introduced is the concept of moving the camera around, which seems kind of obvious, but you know, cameras back then were big and heavy and bulky, and it was actually hard to move them to different angles. Not to mention 
early movies were basically just um, plays. And in plays, you don't have things like wide angle shots and close ups. You don't have pans where the camera can move from side to side. But in a film, you can play around with camera work a bit. So, yeah, D.W. Griffith, he moved the camera around for pans and sliding shots. He shot from different angles. He would shoot actors close up and then uh, shoot out to a very wide shot. Again, none of this is possible in a theater, but he's not making a theater production. He's making a movie and he allowed himself to get creative. He also pioneered a lot of editing techniques, jumping back and forth between multiple stories at once. And actually, that's what makes this four hour film or excuse me, three hour film so difficult to watch because he jumps back and forth between all of these time periods so suddenly. Uh, that's why I like this splice instead. Um, <clears throat> it's basically Intolerance is four separate stories being told at once. And what this edit has done is splice together all of the scenes from that are set in ancient Babylon. It's hard to explain, but basically I just want you to kind of click around through this movie uh, and observe some of the creativity with the camera work. Because even though you may never have heard of this person, um, this film is, yeah, actually pretty epic. And that's another thing that D.W. Griffith pioneered, the idea that a film doesn't have to be just a simple story, a simple movie, but a real life epic that tells big stories and has big narratives. Yeah, so he's a pretty important filmmaker, obscure though he is. Uh, your next filmmaker you probably also have never heard of, Sergei Eidsensee, and his magnum opus, is the battleship Potemkin from 1925. Uh, take a look at this title card. Can you guess what country this is from? If you guessed Russia, you're right. Uh, it is made and set in Russia. Uh, the film, again, was made in 1925, but it tells a story set in 1905. Let me give you a quick synopsis of the film. Uh, it is based on a true story about um, mutiny and mutineers on this Russian battleship called the Potemkin. Uh, they declared mutiny, they took over the ship, they captured or killed the commanding officers um, and yeah, basically took over. Um, and this was a segue into the Russian Revolution of 1905 and an attempt to declare a coup against the Tsar, Tsar Nicholas II. Okay, so uh, the way that the film has uh, transpired up to the section I want you to watch is these sailors are on a ship, morale is very low, and it gets even worse whenever the soldiers examine the food that they're being asked to eat, which is crawling with maggots. Um, the officers tell them to eat it anyway, and the soldiers get uh, very angry about this. The plate reads, give us this day our daily bread, and he smashes it on the floor in a rage. Um, and as an aside, he actually borrows a lot of these angle shots, different close-up shots from the techniques of D.W. Griffith. So the sailors are all mad, and the officers aren't taking it. And so they order all of these mutineers, all of these uh, rowdy, troublemaking soldiers to be lined up and shot. And astonishingly, the firing squad, rather than fire on the, on the soldier who was making trouble, instead fire on the commanding officer, uh, the admiral. And so everyone in the ship runs and captures the officers and takes over, but they need food. So this uh, battleship pulls into Odessa Harbor and they're greeted with thunderous applause and support from the locals uh, who have heard about this mutiny and support their efforts because they also hate the czar and appreciate what this mutiny signifies. And this is the setting leading up to this. So knock, knock, the very, very famous Odessa Steps sequence of the battleship Potemkin. So to back out here again, hi. Um, 
Here's the clip for the battleship Potemkin, uh, the Odessa step sequence. I do want you to watch, if you would, uh, the whole thing. As you can see, it's only about seven minutes long. Um, and it's a pretty powerful sequence. It's still silent, um, which means that it has to rely on title cards in lieu of di dialogue. But it really gets the emotion across of these people getting brutally gunned down by the officers. Uh, so spoiler alert, that's what happens. And as you watch this sequence, I want you to note how he sort of juxtaposes between the soldiers marching down the steps and the people running down the steps and how the cuts keep coming faster and faster and faster to really underscore the tension of this scene. So go ahead and take a moment to pause me and watch the video. Um, yeah, and I'm curious to see what your reactions are. So once you're done with that, um, what this film is really famous for, I don't know why it does this, is its use of what's known as a montage. Knock, knock. A montage is a quick edit, a sequence of images given very fast, fast edits, and no dialogue for the most part. You might think of like the training montage in a Rocky movie, jumping back and forth between several different scenes, uh, sometimes several different characters to get um, a long time period across in just a few minutes. Um, and yeah, Sergei Eisenstein is famous for this technique. I know you've never heard of Battleship Potemkin, but this film is discussed with a lot of admiration, uh, even today. Um, yeah, and actually the entire film is also in the public domain. Um, I believe you can watch it on Amazon Prime if you're interested. Uh, and to sum up what happens after the Odessa Steps montage is um, after the soldiers here uh, march down the steps and murder all of these innocent civilians, uh, the Navy goes to sink the Potemkin that started the trouble. But the Navy wouldn't fire on the ship. They, uh, they sympathize with the Potemkin. And uh, the very last shot of the film shows them taking down the Russian flag and raising the red flag. And um, this film is obviously in black and white, but uh, as you can see, the flag is painted red, and that's the only spot of color in the film. Uh, they actually had to go in with a paintbrush and color it frame by frame, tint it by hand. And this is why the film is famous for another thing. It's the most censored film, possibly in film history. Um, it has been banned in more countries than yeah, any other film up until perhaps the modern era. Uh, let's see, I've got a list here. <laughs> let's see, it was banned in uh, the United States, in France, and in Britain. Uh, and the reason why it was banned isn't because of its uh, violence, it's because it's a communist film. It's a big uh, page of communist sympathies, and that's not exactly something that people wanted to think about in these countries in the 20s through the 50s. Even Stalin banned this film. Even though he was communist ruler, um, he thought that it was a little too sympathetic to the working class and a little too critical of the ruling class for his taste. So yeah, even Stalin didn't like this rebellious film. But it is an interesting one. And if you thought that movie was kind of grim, then I would perhaps warn you against <laughs> watching Au Chien Andalou. All right, so Au Chien Andalou, you may have noticed in Blackboard, uh, watching this movie is a potential homework option. But let me warn you, uh, this movie is kind of gross. It opens up uh, with a rather disturbing shot. Uh, I won't give it away, but it involves an eye. And uh, this movie is completely, totally bizarre. Uh, it's 20 odd minutes long. Um, and I would like to ask you to maybe watch the first minute or so, and then maybe just kind of jump around after that. Uh, you don't have to watch the whole thing unless 
there is a homework option where you watch Un Chien Andalou, which translates to an Andalusian dog. And I want you to tell me in your homework, what do you think this movie is about? What do you think it means? What do you think the filmmakers were trying to say? Um, yeah, and some of you may have watched it or noticed that option already. I'm smiling because it's always so much fun whenever I show this in class because I get to hear my students' reactions. And it's always, always interesting. This movie is, uh, is pretty unusual. So after you've watched it, uh, come on back here. And the film is very famous for this reason. Uh, it is a surreal film. It is an art house film. Uh, if you watch the whole movie, it's filled with these strange and disturbing images, and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't even follow a cohesive storyline. It keeps jumping back and forth between all these different time periods. And uh, the reason it does that is because it wasn't meant to be a movie. It was supposed to be a work of art. And as such, Un Chien Andalou wasn't aired in uh, movie theaters like, you know, The Wizard of Oz might be. It was aired in small venues, coffee shops, and independent theaters. It was really meant to be treated as artwork, not just um, a simple movie. And as odd as it is, you can definitely get that sense that what you're looking at isn't a cohesive movie, but a work of art, all unusual and surreal as it is. And that should come as no surprise if you're familiar with one of the filmmakers, um, Salvador Dali, uh, who actually appears, makes a little cameo in the movie as the priest who is tied to um, an anchor, which is tied to the Ten Commandments, which is tied to a piano upon which are two dead donkeys. Yeah. Did you watch the movie yet? Anyway, yes, yeah, so Salvador Dali, uh, he's a painter. Uh, he's a very famous member uh, and founder of a movement known as Surrealism. And Surrealism is all about um, dream imagery, subconscious imagery, presented in a way that looks almost real. And film is a very good uh, medium for this kind of idea because, yeah, it's not something that makes sense. Um, you can experience an entire lifetime in just a few hours. And so Salvador Dali wanted to play with the idea of a collective dream that people fall asleep to experience. All right, your next movie is called The Cremaster Series by Matthew Barney. And here, let me um, kind of click over to me for a second. I don't have a film clip up here to show you. And that's because Matthew Barney's Cremaster series was never widely released. I use him as a segue to talk about film as movie to film as art. And that's definitely the case for Matthew Barney. Uh, Matthew Barney's Cremaster series, it's a series of five films that Matthew Barney made over a period of eight years, as you can see here, from 94 to 2002. Uh, the storyline of the five films is a little difficult to follow. Um, it centers around this character, The Apprentice, having to uh, go through a series of tasks. Uh, a lot of the imagery is based on uh, Mason um, rituals. Uh, there's a lot of references to Mormon real, uh, theology. And the reason why I don't have a clip up here to show you is for a very important reason. Uh, the Cremaster films have never been released on DVD. You can look for them on Amazon and you're not going to find them. Matthew Barney is very protective of his films and he actually only made... Uh, 20 copies. I looked it up. Uh, there are only 20 copies of the five Cremaster films out there. The only thing that he released widely is something that I typically show in class. Uh, the Order, which is a section from Cremaster 3, again, which he did release widely on DVD. 
Um, yeah, if you ever want to watch it, let me know. Uh, I'll let you borrow my DVD. It's uh, also kind of weird, a little disturbing with a bit of uh, implied nudity in it. I probably wouldn't want to show the whole thing in class anyway. I'd probably get in trouble. Uh, but yeah, that's Matthew Barney. Uh, he's a very famous filmmaker, actually. Uh, but his films are very rarely screened, and even more rarely are they sold. Uh, take a look at this. <clears throat> I went a looking to see um, how I could get my hands on a copy of one of the Cremaster movies, and I found that one of the DVDs went up for auction in 2007, uh, a copy of Cremaster 2. Uh, again, only 20 copies exist of this DVD. This one sold for over half a million dollars at Sotheby's. Um, now that includes all of these artistic elements as well. Uh, but yeah, if you want to watch the Cremaster movies, you either have to wait until they're aired in some sort of independent cinema or shell out half a million dollars to get your own copy. And the idea is that you have to pay big money to see a work of original art and to own it. And that's the way that Matthew Barney feels about his films. And I thought that was kind of interesting given our discussions on art and money and big prizes. But yeah, Matthew Barney, The Cree Master Cycle. It's an interesting set of films. Keep your eyes eager for them. But uh, I haven't seen any screenings for these movies for like 10 years or so. Uh, the last clip I want you to watch has to do with uh, a work of digital art by Lynn Hirschman Leeson. Um, I, I am putting, by the way, a clip. I'm trying to embed them in the movies or uh, in my YouTube video, uh, but I'm also going to put uh, the links in like the comments and stuff. Anyway, uh, if you jump ahead to seven minutes, you'll be introduced to Dina. The conceit is that Dina. Uh, stands for digital DNA. And Dina is uh, a custom software uh, agent. It's That's what the artwork is. The concept is that Dina is a politician running for telepresident. Uh, this is her campaign slogan. And so uh, the way that Dina is designed is she is software. Um, she's connected to the internet. And uh, what you see is a video and a microphone. And what you do is you come up to the microphone and you ask Dina a question, a question about politics and about her policies. And what she does is she's not programmed to have a response. If you ask her, uh, what is your stance on gun ownership or the Second Amendment? She doesn't have a set answer for that. Uh, what she does is she goes online. Part of her software is kind of like a Google search engine. And she'll go online and research her question. And her response is based on the popular opinion gleaned from her online sources. And that's the answer that she gives. So what is your stance on the Second Amendment really just depends on what the political climate is whenever she searches for that question. Um, it's a pretty a uh, fascinating work of art. Uh, and one of the more fascinating things about it is that she actually has a memory. So if I asked her about gun rights, uh, she would give me an answer, but I could also tell her that I agree or disagree with her stance. And she will actually tailor future questions that I ask her uh, based on my response to some of her first questions. And uh, yeah, it's actually a really fascinating uh, piece of software, especially considering how old uh, she is. Uh, just for the sake of context, uh, this voice recognition software um, and search engine was introduced in 2004 and conceived as far back as 1993, whereas uh, Siri, that voice bot, she wasn't introduced until 2010. Yeah, it's a pretty fascinating work of art. And uh, as for what perhaps it is uh, commenting on, here, let me come back to my face. Um, yeah, here's the clip for you to watch, except I'm out of focus. Um, it's like, this is what politicians are. They don't have an opinion. They don't even have a brain. Lynn Hirschman Leeson's robot doesn't 
think. It doesn't have a brain. It just goes online. And that's always her response. And I think there's something very profound about that, considering what politicians are today and how they flip flop on issues based on what their constituents want to hear. That's exactly the kind of politician that Dina is. Um, and I also wanted to show you Dina because um, the medium is digital art. And this is something that you will encounter in your museum visit if you go to, say, the Jepson Center or the SCAD Museum. Uh, art isn't just paintings on walls or sculptures. It can also be film and internet art and interactive art and all sorts of different media. And there's some really fascinating pieces. I mean, you could spend 800 words analyzing and writing on Dina. I know I could. And you might be able to do that on a piece of interactive art at the Jepson Center. They even have video games at the Jepson Center. Students have and you can write your analysis on one of those art video games that you would encounter at the Jepson. So, yeah, maybe I've introduced you to some concepts and uh, films and works of art that are kind of interesting to you. At least I hope so. Uh, but thank you for sticking with me through this kind of unusual presentation. I apologize again for being out of focus. Uh, but I will see you in class, and hopefully this helps you prepare for test two. All right. Thank you.